Thank you. That's us? Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to be in Gurgram, having studied in Delhi and being a graduate of Malan Azad. So what I'm going to talk to you about is really managing unhappy complications in presbyopia intraocular lens as patients. And when do we get unhappy patients? We get unhappy patients when they're surprised, when they don't get what they're expecting. And it's all about, in presbyopia surgery, presbyopia lens surgery, it's a matter of optimization. It's a matter of using lenses to get as wide a focal range as we can with the least quality of vision, this disrupt quality of vision compromise. And hence, we tend to get two particular types of patients who are the reasons for being unhappy. You get patients with residual defocus and torus or refractive surprises, and you get patients who are neuroadaptation failures because they don't adapt well to the halos and glare that come with a lot of these. Inaccurate spherical targeting is a very common thing that can happen if your biometry systems are not up to date. This happens for a number of eyes, small eyes, lower tolerances. All presbyopia lenses, they have lower tolerances for defocus errors as such. And any defocus will make the glare and halos worse. Patient in that is then confused, is it the lens or is it the refractive error? And you can enhance these quite easily. Astigmatism is even more of a problem because the tolerance for astigmatism with multifocal or presbyopia lenses is even more critical and it's much less. So we have to aim for getting patients to under half adapter of cylinder post-op. And there are various ways we could do this, either by astigmatic erototomies, LRIs, after, afterwards, or secondary toric piggyback lenses. And in very high levels of cells, I think it's important to talk to patients and say it'll be a two-stage bioptics procedure. What about contrast and halos? This is something that is part and parcel of breast biopia lenses because there is a trade-off and then we expect the neuroadaptation process to improve on these symptoms. And before you actually do an intraocular lens exchange to get rid of patients who have insufferable glare and halos or contrast issues. It's important to talk to patients and show them what they will lose in terms of their reading ability in exchange for being better in terms of halos and glare. And it's quite amazing how many patients then at that stage feel, no, it's not worth it. There are standard expectations for our cataract patients. The patients who are seeking press bipolar have very high expectations. They have obsessive personalities and they have lower tolerances for accepting anything less than so-called perfect vision. And it's important to keep that in mind that any surgical complication can have these. So how do we manage these problems? You have to define the problem. You have to target the refraction to think in terms of the quality of vision, and you have to think in terms of the neuroadaptation. One has to be open and talk to the patients very clearly. You have to answer their questions very fully. You have to work with the patient and never ignore their complaints because the moment you start patronizing the patient, it becomes very difficult to manage things further. So what about prevention? Before you start doing press wipe lenses, in terms of understanding how do you protect yourself? How do you set up your own systems before we can get into this? The first thing is to set very realistic expectations. It's very important for patients to know exactly what kind of vision they will get. And this has to be an open, frank, honest doctor-patient partnership. Patients invariably want spectacle independence. And the first thing I say to them is, no, you will never be spectacle independent because there will always be certain situations in certain types of light and certain types of sizes of print that they will still need spectacle for fine neogen tasks, for example. So this is what I say to them. You will see well enough to legally drive a car without glasses. You'll be able to read most things in good light without glasses. 
I then go on to say to them, you will need spectacles for fine neurogen tasks, and some patients prefer to use a pair of spectacles for night driving. So this gives a very clear idea as to what they expect. I then talk to them about the contrast. I then talk to them about the glare, halo, and starbursts. And I say to them, and this is how I put to them, that you cannot get multifocality without getting these ha halos because that's a law of physics. So when you see a halo after your surgery, think in terms of the lens is doing what it's designed to do, and hence it becomes a positive thing for the patient to look for. We know that with neuroadaptation, all these symptoms tend to improve, and there is good scientific evidence now to show that within six months, the functional MRI studies show that there is significant neuroadaptation in multifocal patients. Then we have the standard things that happen with any type of surgery. We have to talk to them about the certainty and the uncertainty. And we get these figures that less than 5% of patients will need an enhancement, and less than 1% end up with worse vision than what they have to begin with. A key area is your biometry targeting, and it's very important that you have to be as good as this gentleman here who's carrying bricks on his head. But it has to be that precise for us to get our presbyopia patients to good outcomes. So one has to be aware, one has to diagnose and treat dry eye, or ocular surface disease. This is something which is very common. It catches quite a lot of people out, especially before your biometry, it's important to get the surface right. During the surgery, it's important to get the surface right because this is something which can increase the glare and the halos and the contrast, and it becomes very difficult then after surgery to then say, okay, you now have a dry eye if initially you didn't tell the patient that. There is always an opportunity when you do the second eye to try and reduce any potential problems. So you could look at what is the issue that a patient is facing after the first eye, and you could choose what to do for the second eye. There's a whole number of reasons you can do this. There are ways you could use the same multifocal, a different multifocal, an EDOF lens, or you could choose a slightly different defocus using monofocals and monovision or enhanced monofocals or an EDOF lens. Which way we do this, the actual process in my practice is this. We do the first eye, and at the second eye, if the patient is happy with everything, we just repeat the same thing. If the patient wants even better near vision, so they are happy with their distance vision, they're happy with their glare and halos, then you either put in half a diopter or one diopter of myopia in the second eye, or you personalize it with a multifocal lens which has more near vision performance. If patients want even better distance vision, let's say the patient ends up half a diopter myopic, they're fantastic for near, but they want even better distance vision, then I would consider a monofocal in the second eye or an EDOF lens in the second eye. If the patient is happy with the near vision but struggles with halos and glare and they're really concerned about the night driving, then after checking that they don't have any significant defocus or torus, we tend to then use a monofocal for the second eye. So really, by using these strategies, we can prevent our patients from getting unhappy. And if they do get unhappy and we get poor outcomes, we can get them to good results almost all the time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Pandey. Um, my question to you is that which is your preferred IOL? Presbyopic IOL. There isn't my preferred IOL. Okay. It's a bit like asking a professional photographer, mm. you will only use one lens for all types of photography. Yeah. It's impossible. So I think it's very important to customize each lens to each patient. Okay. And not just each patient, but each patient's eye. Because each lens will have a particular advantage and limitation. Mm. And how we use these in a combination to generate the binocular visual percept is the key to this. So I use trifocals, I use EDOFs, I use enhanced monofocals, I use monofocals, 
and we don't charge in my practice separately based on lenses. Okay. We have one price for everything and we just say, we get you the best vision possible with everything that's possible on this planet. Okay. 